Welcome to everyone again. Good afternoon and welcome to today's information webinar to discuss um, how WRLC faculty can participate in two OER programs, uh, the Open at WRLC Open Textbook Library Review Stipend Program and the Faculty Course Transformation Grant. Um, we are also going to discuss today how OER facilitates um, diversity, equity, and inclusion principles. My name is Trisha Clark. I am the Community College Engagement Librarian at the University of the District of Columbia, or otherwise known as UDC. Um, we are recording this meeting for those who are not able to attend synchronously, and you will get the um, recording at the end of the presentation, probably within 24 hours or so. Um, next slide, please. Actually. Yeah, okay, <laughs> next slide after that. Um, so please take a moment, if you have not done so already, please take a moment to update your Zoom name uh, to indicate which institution you are affiliated with today. Um, to do this, just go to the participants window, hover over your name and click more, then click rename, um, and then enter the two letter abbreviation of your institution followed by your first name and last name. We're actually using this information to confirm participant requirements. Um, and I'm gonna pause to give you guys a few minutes to do that if you have not done so already. I think most of you have, it looks like, based on our list today. Yep, you have. Okay. All right. So uh, next slide, please. All right. So I am a member of the WRLC's Textbook Affordability Working Group. Um, our team members represent most of the WRLC schools. So please Take note of the contact at your school so that you can follow up with them if you have any questions. Um, if there are any faculty members attending from schools that don't have a representative that is listed, you can contact the WRLC open contact at open at wrlc.org. Next slide, please. Okay, so today's agenda, um, we are going to discuss what open textbooks are and their various benefits, the details of the review program and stipend, um, the faculty course transformation grant, and we're also going to highlight how OER facilitates DEI principles. Right, next slide. So open textbooks are similar to traditionally published higher ed material, primarily because they are written by faculty and other experts in the subject area, specifically for college level courses. Um, these materials also undergo rigorous editorial processes, including peer review. However, they do differ from traditionally published materials uh, because access is online and they are completely free for students and faculty. Open textbooks are also um, they have flexible licenses uh, called Creative Commons licenses or CCBY licenses, uh, which gives you permission to download, to share, to remix, and adapt the material as appropriate to your course. And we're going to talk about that, um, how you can do that in some more detail later. All right. And so now I will turn it over to my colleague, Rachel. Thank you, Tricia. Sure. Um, so we'll start by talking a little bit about what is and is not OER, because there tend to be a lot of misconceptions. A common misperception is that use of any freely available materials is the same thing as using OER in a classroom. So you find a website, you're able to access it, and you incorporate it into a class. However, to be considered OER, it must meet a few criteria. Uh, first, the materials that are created with education um, as its primary focus are ones that are considered to be OER. The most common example of OER, as Trisha mentioned, is um, an electronic or digital textbook but it can include a variety of educational materials, uh, including classroom slides, a syllabus, or other ancillary materials. And we'll come to that, back to that point later. A second uh, criteria is that the material must expressly give permission to use and reuse materials, as Trisha mentioned. This permission is often given through a Creative Commons license. Uh, there are many different Creative Commons licenses available, as you can see in the chart at the bottom of this slide. Um, However, for material to be considered OER, it must allow derivatives or, in other words, adaptations of the original work. If a Creative Commons license contains the letters ND, which stands for non-derivative, that means that derivatives or adaptations are not allowed, and thus the material cannot be considered OER. So you can see at the bottom of the, the graphic, those last two, CCBYND and CCBYNCND, are two licenses that are not uh, OER compatible. And finally, with uh, other materials with these permissions can be used even if they weren't created with education as a primary focus. Open access journal articles with an appropriate Creative Commons license is a good example, but some freely available websites 
such as government created materials also have the level of permission needed to be used as OER. And uh, I always say to my students, and this is appropriate here, but um, if you have questions, just ask a librarian. <laughs> Anyone that we uh, listed previously is more than happy to help determine whether something that you would like to use would be considered OER. There is a lot of OER out there and you do not have to sort through it alone. Um, so on this slide are listed some ways uh, or some resources to help you find OER material. Again, you may consider working with a, a TOG or WRLC member, as well as the, an appropriate subject or reference librarian at your institution. They are generally well-versed in finding OER materials. There are also numerous OER collections and some of the most popular ones listed here. Um, and just to note that second to last link is something that George Mason maintains that's a meta finder. So a searcher of various different OER databases. Additionally, UDC has a dedicated OER libguide, which is open to anyone to use to, that can also help you find material. As I mentioned before, OER is not just textbooks. There's also software like Lumen Learning, along with ancillary materials like question banks and sample assignments. So it's really a pretty broad and diverse field. So now to talk about the two programs. Uh, the first one by attending today's workshop, everyone in attendance here is now eligible to write a review for an OER textbook. If you do, you'll receive a $200 stipend for that review, which is funded by the WRLC. You will receive an email from the Open Education Network after today's session, which will contain instructions and all the information you need to complete the review. Research by the Open Textbook Library has shown a direct correlation between faculty who review an open textbook and faculty who eventually adopt one to a course. So this is a great first step for anyone who is potentially interested in adopting OER for a course. Speaking of OER course adoption, uh, WRLC is now offering a $2,000 course transformation grant to support and incentivize WRLC instructors who want to replace their existing commercial textbook with low cost or no cost courseware material using open educational resources. All WRLC our instruct instructors are eligible to apply for this program. We began this program in uh, the spring of 2023 with 15 instructors throughout the consortium creating revised syllabi and other support materials needed to transform their courses into one using OER resources. These revised courses are now being taught and WRLC will begin accepting applications for the second year of this program in January, 2024. We will offer workshops in the spring that will provide more specific details on this program, but you can also check out the website and see the link on the slide, or you can ask again, your TOG representative for more details. And of course, if you do have questions, we'll have plenty of time for Q and A at the end of the session. So turning now, uh, we're going to begin discussing how OER aligns with DEI values. So we're going to start by looking at the values of equity and accessibility. One of the most direct links between OER and DEI uh, use is that an, um, OER use is an equitable practice because it removes a barrier to classroom participation. This includes both a financial barrier as well as an access barrier that other textbook alternatives uh, in terms of access, uh, such as course reserves, actually maintain. So you can make your um, expensive or not so expensive textbook available on course reserves, but there is still an uh, access to equitable, um, a barrier to equitable access to that resource with course reserves. This doesn't mean that there aren't other barriers to consider, such as the availability of internet access, which is required in order to use electronic resources like OER, but OER does facilitate access to course materials during the course, as well as long after the, uh, the student has taken the course. Helping students see themselves as lifelong learners is a goal for many institutions, whether formally or informally. Making resources available to a student beyond the scope of the course enables them to revisit these materials for a variety of educational and applied purposes. Increasing the educational return on investment as these in students engage with the material in different ways over time. 
such as supporting future learning in and out of the classroom or enabling professional success development. Another aspect of access is the accessibility of the material itself or potential barriers to use that uh, users may experience due to the design and presentation of the material. Accessibility is not guaranteed with OER materials, and there's a wide range of accessibility for OER materials, with only some materials incorporating accessibility needs into their design and presentation. However, since OER materials can be used and repurposed, it is much easier for faculty to adapt OER materials to fit the needs of their students. Accessibility standards are also a key component to WLC's course transformation grant that we discussed earlier. And all educational materials, such as syllabi that are created in the course of the grant, must comply with basic digital accessibility standards, such as machine uh, readability and alternative text for images. So next, we're going to look at some ways in which OER contributes to class engagement, as well as inclusive pedagogy principles. As we discussed with accessibility, the ability to adapt course materials also facilitates inclusive pedagogy. And Tricia will talk specifically about that um, in some other contexts a bit later. Um, finally, by removing a barrier to participation, OER also facilitates student engagement within the course. So let's take a closer look. Incorporation of OER into the classroom is an inclusive practice, and that inclusiveness can and has been directly measured. One outcome of use of OER is that it increases classroom participation, likely due to equity and access to course materials. Students who can more easily access the readings and homework for classes are better equipped to participate in classroom discussion or connect their readings with other course content. Studies also show that use of OER enables students to both stay in the course and help them pass the course. Studies have shown that this benefit is true for disadvantaged students, again, likely by pro providing those students with a more equitable experience through access to materials. And beyond these measurable outcomes, students generally re respond positively to use of OER in their classes. In spring 2023, a student at American University designed and ran a, a survey for students to gather data related to OER at AU. This included data such as the cost and affordability, affordability of the textbooks for the uh, students that participated in the survey, level of university support for textbooks, and perceptions of OER use in a classroom. So as you can see on this slide, the students were overwhelmingly positive about OER use. 92% of those surveyed agreed that they feel or would feel more understood and connected to professors who use OER. This shows that the benefits of OER are multifaceted and can, uh, can be a powerful way to connect with students while providing a more inclusive classroom experience. And I pulled out a few quotes just to get an idea of uh, the real robust responses that we received from students. As you can see, there's really a, quite a lot of demand. Um, from students or, uh, who are eager to engage with OER materials. And with that, I will turn things back to Tricia to discuss some more benefits. All right, thank you, Rachel. So as Rachel mentioned, uh, the nature of OER, um, specifically its ability to be remixed and adapted is perfectly suited to allow for adaptations that not only suit um, faculties, students, um, and courses, but also to be culturally relevant. And I think that's really important. Um, in a book entitled Globalized E-Learning Cultural Challenges, and I'm actually going to put a link to the ebook in the chat just so you can see it. Um, let me do that here. Uh, this book, um, edited by Andrea Edmondson, provides a model called the Cultural Adaptation Model Process, um, or CAP, that analyzes the complexity of e-learning or online course content, um, which is intended for adaptation. Um, so it analyzes the content, the source culture of uh, metho methodological preferences, and the host culture methodological preferences. Um, after analysis, Edmonton recommends four different levels of adaptation based on the content type or complexity. And those levels are translation, localization, modularization, and origination. Um, and so 
So with translation, it's important to know that it can be complicated um, due to things like slang um, from original material and concepts that may not translate well or at all. Um, and so instructors and OER creators really should be mindful of keeping slang, symbols, icons uh, to a minimum or remove them altogether. Um, localization includes planning and developing concepts in accordance with the local culture. Modularization employs creating different modules to provide a variety of opportunities using different instructional strategies and tools. And origination really speaks to using cultural insiders um, in the production of original content for those um, students. In fact, some researchers note that creating original learning materials uh, with the target culture as the focus, uh, instead of simply modifying pre-existing educational materials would make them much more effective. Um, so really instructors and OER creators should be intentional about reviewing materials and making changes as needed um, based on culture, um, but ideally, and whenever possible, consider creating and producing original content or working with cultural insiders to do that. All right, so OER is also instrumental in creating space for diversity in academic publishing. Um, uh, so despite some recent advances that have resulted in organizations like We Need Diverse Books um, and a push for more books written by diverse authors with diverse characters, and this um, I think is, is kind of prevalent in the children's book publishing industry, um, the publishing industry is still woefully lacking, particularly in racial and ethnic diversity. Uh, this lack of diversity includes university presses. In 2019, Lee and Lowe Books published an updated report on the US publishing sector, and I can share a link to that as well for those who are interested. Um, <clears throat> um, updated report on the US public publishing sector, which included university presses. The report determined that the university press workforce is 81% white, uh, which is even whiter than the full surveyed landscape, which is 76% white. So unfortunately, not much has changed in either the academic publishing world um, or the entire publishing industry as a whole, despite university pledges um, from the big five publishers, which includes uh, publishers like Penguin, Random House, and Macmillan. Um, there is a, another report that was done, and I can send you a link to that. I've done all the research for you, so you don't have to. Um, uh, so this recent report shows that not much has changed, um, both in the academic publishing world and uh, the publishing world in general. Um, and so it's evident from a more recent report um, that these issues are still happening. Um, the lack of diversity is apparent with not only just editorial staff, but this includes authors and even booksellers. So publishing OER provides an alternative um, publishing model uh, that encourages authors of various backgrounds to publish using a variety of publishing tools and platforms. Um, the platforms and tools are free and also they're also diverse, um, they're different kinds. So this allows educators and OER creators to choose what kind of platforms work best for them um, from a range of options. These materials are of course also peer reviewed by a diverse set of readers. Right. So all of these observations uh, point to the fact that publishing OER enables educators to bypass the gatekeeping that tends to happen, that still tends to happen um, in traditional publishing contexts. So hopefully um, we've uh, convinced you to do some <laughs> either remixing or adaptations or publishing some new material on your own. All right. And this brings us to the end of our presentation. We hope you have, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to either unmute yourself or to um, put some questions in the chat. And we have lots of time as well as several TOG representatives present. Yeah. So this is a great place to ask any Absolutely. kinds of questions that you might have. And while we're thinking about questions, just to point us to the chat, um, Joel has added a link into the chat um, that if you're here, you should uh, get uh, credit for that. And this will help us make sure that you get that Open Education Network email that I talked about so that you can review a textbook if you'd like to. So um, just make sure to click on the link um, that Joel provided. So wait, that's not the right link. Is it? Yes, it is. Never mind. I was reading the title. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> it's the check-in for the title of our program. Thanks, Professor Yarish. Always good to see you. <laughs> so
So of course, this is being recorded. If you don't have questions live, that's okay. You can always reach out to us separately later today, tomorrow, whenever. Um, and um, if you would like to reach out to your own talk representative, that's um, lovely. But you know, you can feel free to reach out to any of us. We all have the same um, resources and hope we'll be able to help you if you have any questions about either publishing or reviewing or any of the other things we've mentioned in today's presentation.